Hello and welcome back to Let's Talk Tachlis. Wow, it's been a while, but I'm very happy to be with you again today. Uh, this podcast was filmed out of the studio. We went we went to Gaulis a little bit, but it was worth it. It was the Yuride Letzori Chalie. We discussed a very amazing subject, which is, which is called Panusa. We all need Panusa. We all work hard to bring in Panusa to our homes, to feed our kids and families, and to do other good things with our Panusa, but Panusa is not easy. So today we really had an amazing conversation with Rabshia Rubenstein, a very famous Asken, that is actually doing things and working very hard to help Klaalis throw with Panusa. I think you're going to be fascinated. Stay tuned, watch the whole episode. And as always, you can send me comments on let's talk tachles now.com. Also, please, please subscribe on YouTube and other platforms so we can have a quicker and easier time to bring the conversations to you. It's your podcast. It's your home. It's nothing to do with me. I'm just a mailman, as I always tell you. So let's go for it. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome back to Let's Talk Tachlis. We're so glad to have you here today. Today, we have a guest that really should be working in a hat store. Our guest is carrying so many hats, is wearing so many hats that I really don't know where to begin with you. But I hope we'll manage to narrow down the fields of activities and to talk about some very important subject, inspiring subjects and your favorite activities of helping Yiddish people in the world. So without further ado, it's my pleasure and honor to have you to be here today with my good friend, Rabshi Rubenstein. Hello. Good afternoon, Rabbi Aaron. What a pleasure to be on your podcast, Let's Talk Tachlis. I'm a big fan myself. I've been watching the podcast and I'm honored to be part of your lineup. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I very carefully choose my lineup, so you made the cut on the first minion. Okay. Amazing. So um, let's share with the audience a little bit who is Rabshia Rubenstein, your background, your up, your, your up gro- your growing up, your history, your past quickly, so we can get a little warmed up and get into the, the act of things. Sure. So thank you once again for the opportunity to be on your podcast. Um, I think it's fantastic when there's kosher media and so many great alternatives to perhaps what's out there. Um, you know, from Jewish music to podcasts, especially now during the three weeks, of course. Um, so to give you a brief uh, background about myself, I'm another average Joe, but if, uh, if it means much for the context of this interview. So I was born in uh, the Bronx. My father was a Rav who was also born in the Bronx. And um, my father was a Rav and a Seifer, and he chose to live in the Bronx because that worked for his Parnosa. He moved for a very short period of time in the early 1970s to Borough Park on 60th Street and 15th Avenue, which was completely Italian. There were no Jews then. I was going to say, did he keep the house? And <laughs> after six months, he couldn't do proper Parnosa because as a Seifer, there were too many suffering in Borough Park, whereas in the Bronx, there were still you know, not that many. So he moved back to the Bronx and he continued to become a Rav in a shul. Uh, the cousin, the Rebbe of Borough Park, moved to Borough Park in the 70s and my father took over that shul. And he, he wrote over 40 svarim. He was the art scroll before art scroll. So he had a from background and he, you know, in, in very high vocabulary English, he did pamphlets and books on kashras, chupa, geiris, eriv, and he made 40 different books, um, which were you know, distributed and sold at that time in the 60s and 70s. So I'm dealing with a Benon Shekadoshim here. So I always say, you know, I'm a belt filler chazan, so I'm on this side of the Amid, and my father was on the other side of the Amid. <laughs> but I grew up in the Bronx, and then I, uh, I went to Yeshiva in Manhattan, Chavetz Chaim, and eventually we moved to Borough Park, and I ended up going to Babiv at a... Uh, fantastic experience there and uh it was it was great 
and uh, now I live in Marine Park, Brooklyn. So that's, uh, that's the shortcut of uh, my background. But my father passed away when I was six years old. So that, um, that, that prompted me, I guess, to become more of a, um, you know, more, you know, to have that extra... Independence, maybe? Interesting. I, I don't know. I guess it manifests itself in different ways, but you're also much more caring or thoughtful of other people because of, you know, where you came from. And I think that what, that's what prompted me after many years, you know, like everyone else, you go to yeshiva, you get married, you work, but perhaps that's what prompted me to get involved in, you know, nonprofit and in helping other people. So I feel very honored that I'm able to be part of that puzzle, but um, perhaps that's where it started. It's nice to hear because unfortunately many people, when they have a, a father or mother passing away, it breaks them. It makes them weak and depend, depending on others. And Baruch Hashem here, we see the opposite, that it gave you the koiches and the strength. I, I myself am a victim of the same background, more or less. And Baruch Hashem, um, I hope and thank Hashem for not being tziklapt and being able to have Baruch Hashem a decent life. So I find this story very touching and heartwarming, and I like to hear that. So I wanted to discuss today, I know that you are heading, you created the JCC of Marine Park, and I think you were a model for copy. Other people took after you, I don't know if so successful as you, but they are, they copied this idea. And I know that you don't cover just Marine Park, you have a very broad umbrella and you cover a lot of Yiddish communities, if it's Borough Park, Williamsburg, I know even Monroe and New Square and other places where you do a lot of asconas and you help people. I'd like to focus today maybe on the topic that you do so much in p of helping people with Parnassa. And we all know that Odo Marishan was already cursed to not have an easy time with Parnassa. And it's a very challenging um, assignment and responsibility, especially for men, but also for women in today's day and age, to carry the all and bring food to the table for the kids and the family and marry them off eventually and hopefully turn them into uh, to independent Panusa makers. So I want to talk about this subject and a little bit if you can tell me why is this subject such a focal point in your, among other things, in your daily activities? So that's a very good question. So I, I think what happened is when I came to Marine Park uh, in 2006 or so, I noticed that our community didn't have proper representation. You know, there are different neighborhoods like Williamsburg and Borough Park, or as you mentioned, Monroe and Square. They have an infrastructure and they have representation, but I felt like Marine Park was a growing community. At the time, there must have been 200 or 300 families. It was growing extremely rapidly, where to the point that every year, 200 families were coming in, and there were 1,200 or 1,000 to 1,200 young families so that's when I came up with the idea with a friend or two to start something called the JCC of Marine Park. The name the JCC was taken just because it's a national name that everyone can identify with. Uh, some communities refer to it as a Jewish community council, while others refer to it as a Jewish community center. Either one works. Yeah. Right, and the idea was really to be the eyes and ears and voice representing the community needs. From that, it started becoming a local social service organization. So if people needed help with jobs or Medicaid and food stamps or utilities or emergencies, you know, and then of course, you know, interacting with elected officials, bringing in money for the community and, you know, many other local related items. But I had an epiphany in 2008 and then in 2013. 2008, we had the crash and people were really hurting with Parnassa. So I put together an event called um, Surviving the Recession, and I brought Ben Brothman to come speak on telling people, even if Parnassa is not perfect, don't do the wrong thing. I brought Rabbi Pesach Kron to speak about giving people chizik. And then finally, I brought uh, another fellow from Baltimore who uh, specialized in financial literacy. So he created a book and uh, we gave it out to give people kind of like a guide on different resources. And then right before we did the event, I started something called Project Mazon or Project Machal, 
which the idea was like Tamcha Shabbos, but instead of getting packages, you get a food credit of 50 or $100 in the grocery. So this is what we started in 2008. But I continued to be a social service organization until 2013 when I said, you know what, as a business person, the focus cannot be about Tamcha Shabbos only and helping people and emergencies and mo Medicaid and food stamps. How do we help people become self-sufficient? Because that's really what they want, and that's what the Rambam teaches us. And they even have a saying, you know, teach a man to fish instead of giving him the fish. So I started focusing for the past seven, seven or eight years, or even more, on initiatives to help people become self-sufficient. And um, fast forward to today, um, I co-founded an organization within the JCC called JCON for Jewish conferences, and we run several large conferences a year to help people with specific industries and entrepreneurs. So I've been involved with uh, TribeWorks, which is for entrepreneurs, and then JCON has JCON Real Estate and JCON E-Commerce and Architectural Design and Architects and Healthcare and Elder Care and several industries that are specific and trying to help people grow in that industry. In addition to that, um, I have about two to 3,000 students a year that take courses in one of our locations or online, and we teach them anything from QuickBooks, Excel, Word, Microsoft Office, photography, um, graphics, social media, optimization, marketing. So the idea really is, is that the courses are not here to replace, let's say, college, but the idea is if you want to have a side hustle or you want to be worth more money in your job or if you're doing a job or you have a business and you want to make some extra money or for women that maybe want only to work part-time or from home. So I try to give that extra value and Baruch Shem, we've been very much liach with the courses as well as with the big and small events. Wow, this, the, these numbers are staggering. It's like exactly what I said, you wear many hats, right? We try. Baruch Shem, I think we affect the lives of about 11,000 people, Parnassah-wise, and I didn't even mention all the different projects we do, including mentoring, but the idea is really, how do we focus on helping individuals with Parnassah, getting a job, or even explain to them how to look for the right job, and then how to help people to start a business or maintain a business or scale their business because a lot of people can have someone give them a few dollars and they'll start a business or they can have a few dollars saved up and start a business but there's a huge difference between starting a business running a business and scaling a business I want to ask in general the Jewish community I guess it depends in the neighborhoods but are they less professional as you just said as a group in running a business and running an efficient business and, and finding the niche in the market or we know some of them are very successful maybe a smaller percent than in different communities i'm just trying to figure out if the jewish community needs more business teaching support than common communities in america so i think that Every community has its advantages. Um, Baruch Shem, in our community, because we're insular to a certain extent, it's a little bit easier to gather business or to ask people if you want to reach out. Um, there's more resources. We have, Baruch Shem, more nonprofits than you know ever before. And Jewish giving is very big because it has been baked into us to give tzedakah, to give of our time, to give back, you know, we, we find a higher purpose. But, um, but I think that like every other person, you have to be educated. I'm not saying that you have to necessarily go to college to be educated, but at the end of the day, if you needed surgery and you had option A, somebody that understands that just left medical school yesterday, or someone who did surgery for 15 years, would you go to the person who went to medical school? So the answer is, you know, you could have a good head and the fashtais to see, you appreciate it, you have a business mind, but if you don't have the expertise, I always tell people, you can learn from your mistakes or from my mistakes. So you're gonna get, you're gonna get there, and sometimes part of the Harvard education of the real world is to make mistakes, and that's part of life, but you could make that life 
y you know, easier, or you can learn from your own mistakes. So um, I think we have an advantage, and it's not necessarily even the smartest people who are most successful, because there are many other demographics who are smarter than us, like on paper, when it comes to math or other things. So I don't think it's a matter of being smart necessarily. Take a look at this. Who are the smartest people? You have uh, you know, professors who are teaching in college. They're not necessarily the smartest business people. Doctors are brilliant at doing surgery, but they may not be the smartest business people. So I don't think that smart necessarily equates with success. I think that you know, you, everyone... Because the Yiddish people claim they have the Yiddish cup. They are the, the brilliant minds of, of the world. And you see on the, all the Nobel Peace Prizes, stuff like this, is a big percentage of the Jewish people. But like you said, it doesn't, have, doesn't always translate to dollars and cents and knowing how to actually run a business and make it uh, a successful continuation. I realize many businesses take off well and, and start decently well with a decent idea and decent resources, but m some of them don't end up staying in business. And I think this is what, uh, also an important component of what people have to learn, what, like you said, what not to do. That's very, very true. And remember that when you start a business and you're a one-man operation, and you know the common, the common theme I always hear is, oh, if I don't get it done, it won't get it done. I have to do it myself or it won't get it done, or people don't understand. I know how I run my business. You know, so that's the small-time guy. He doesn't really have a company because if he leaves, there is no company. So he has a good job. It's called a company, and he provides a service and product. But that type of small company where you're very involved, and then the big company that's doing 25 million in sales with 100 employees and managers, that's a different business. So let's say you go into the uh, concrete business, mm -hmm. and you get one customer, two customers, you're making some parnasa, and you're doing everything yourself, and you're paying your bills, and you have three jobs and four jobs, so it's enough for you to make a living. But if you scale, and now you're doing 25 million in business and you have so many people, that's running a totally different type of business because you need the right people, the right managers, the right cash flow, and you have to know how to scale correctly. Otherwise, you think you're making money because $25 million happened to walk in the door, but if you're not doing it correctly or if you're not managing it properly and now you're spending so much money on infrastructure to keep the, the, the monster alive, you could wake up to find out that you lost $2 million. So growing incorrectly is a common misconception that a lot of people from the outside may view it, but at the same token, they're, you know, if they don't do it correctly, then um, they can make that huge mistake. You know, there's the famous story of an old man who had a business for many years, and he started to get all the talk. He brought in his kids to the business, and one of them was an accountant. Famous story. One was an accountant, one was a and analyst and this and that and they told him after two years dad you're losing money he said do me a favor i managed well for 40 years i did money i married you up i sent you to college don't be smarter than me but i think it's a huge besides the non-profit i think it's a huge chesed to give people the independence and the coiches and the capability to to have the tools and and really figure out how to stay afloat and slowly growing in a healthy way, it's almost more important than giving them money to go into business because money can work or cannot work. But if you, if you help them manage and navigate through, it gives them a much bigger potential in the future. And I if you think about it in multiples, you know, I've reached out to several, uh, to, to some very major, major nonprofit organization that gives money to nonprofit organizations. And if I tell them, can you please give me $10,000 to do a street fair or to give people money for Shabbos, they're going to think about it. But if I tell them, give me $10,000 because with this $10,000, I can help 10 people get a job and they're going to make a million dollars, that's where they give their money. It's not a Jewish organization, but I, I, see, the, I see the beauty in it because I used to think, one minute, these people that I'm asking money for need food for Shabbos. They're going to they're gonna go crazy otherwise. But now, as I get older and hopefully a little bit smarter, I realize that what the Rambam said previously, that you know, instead of giving a person a piece of fish, give them the rod to fish, it really helps that much more. And 
I hope you know that we're having a little impact because, like you mentioned, it's not only for Marine Park. We do all these conferences and courses for anyone that we can help. Yes. Yeah, so, <coughs> excuse me. So here at Let's Talk Tachlis, we we like to be an influence on this on, on society and the Yiddish society. And uh, I'd like to hear like where people can can either go on a website or somewhere. Where, where if you can tell us a little bit to give people the tools or the tips where to start uh, gaining from the gr amazing services you offer to the community. Sure. So I, I would say there's a few things with regards to resources. So our website, which is jccmp, as in marinepark.org, you can, as soon as you go onto the website, it's going to ask you to put in your email address. As soon as you do that, anytime that we do give a course, you're going to get a notification, and then you can just decide... Um, if you want to sign up for the courses, um, all of our courses are free. Sometimes we do charge you money just to sign up to hold the space to make sure that you're actually going to show up. But if you do come to the course, whether it be in person or online, um, you will get your uh, fee reimbursed because we're not trying to take your money, but rather to make sure you have skin in the game, as they say. Um, there's another uh, there's another great resource that I work with very closely called the Jewish Entrepreneur and they provide mentors for people that are in business. You're a small business, you want to grow, you don't know what you're doing right and wrong and Baruch Hashem, I have this chus of mentoring over 30 companies a year and I see this day in and day out. You know, I'm doing 250,000 in sales, why am I not making money? I'm doing 2 million in sales, why am I losing $200,000? Or Very common. I'm doing a million dollars in sales and I'm making $50,000. How do I go to the next level because my infrastructure costs are so high? So I'm not profitable, but if I hit $10 million, my infrastructure will remain the same. So how do I get to scale to the next level because I don't know how to hire managers and I don't trust people because if I don't do it, it doesn't get done. You know, I always tell them Warren Buffett doesn't pick up his own telephones at the office, he's not the copy machine girl, and he's not the secretary. So there is a way, you know, Bill Gates Delegate. doesn't, doesn't yeah, you have to learn how to delegate. So the Jewish Entrepreneur, you can Google it, or if you reach out to uh, the JCC, we can gladly give you that information. So you should know that even though there are so many nonprofits, there are so many resources out there, whether at our courses or the JCon conferences. But again, go to our website, jccmp.org, sign up and we'll uh, supply you with all the new courses that keep on coming out and all the conferences that we do. If you want mentoring, you could reach out to the Jewish Entrepreneur. And um, yeah, so there's so, so I want it, oh, Amazing. I'm sure you're going to get bombarded with emails and phone calls. Watch out, okay? 11,000 people a year so far. Let's Le see if we can get another 11,000 people. Let's Talk is a very popular podcast, and a lot of people are following, and every, many people need help out there, obviously. There's no more joy that I would have if people called me from other communities and said, I want to do this in my community. And we have, I have been involved in doing these and similar services for other communities to try to be you know, helpful in some small way. Amazing. Um, oh, I want to ask you a question that I often hear from people. People ask the very basic question, which has, has a deep answer, but it's hard to sell it. Should I go work for someone else because I don't have the confidence of running my own business? Or should I open a company? It's very exciting to have a company, you know. You pay to give a corporation, you become a president of the Lemaise. Not everyone is, is properly designed, let's call it like this, to run a company. And many people do very well as employees for other firms. So what is the general mahalach that you, tell, you, you, you would guide people of how to decide versus one versus the other? So that's a great question, and I get that very often. So I would say two things. Number one, it, it really depends on your personality. Some people want that nine to five. They don't mind getting yelled at, at a boss, by a boss, and they just want their paycheck and to go home. But to a certain extent, they know that their growth is limited. At the same token, it's a blessing in disguise too. Because even if you're the type of guy who wants to do your own thing, remember, you're, you need the Harvard education of the real world. So let's say for argument's sake, you want to uh, 
purchase multifamily buildings. It costs money, and you know, okay, I have to raise money, I get a mortgage, and I fix up some apartments, I rent it out, flip. and flip it. But again, either you're learning now from your own mistakes, and all it takes is one mistake, and it's a million dollars, or worse, or you get a bad reputation. So I'm a huge fan that if you want to, it's just like medical school, you want to become a heart surgeon, you go to medical school, you learn, and then you, they make you go to the hospital to do it with doctors, you get that experience, and then you're the king. Same thing over here in business. Let's say you, like I remember I have a friend who uh, is very successful today. He made up in his mind that he wants to be in the stock market. He had no connections. He went to yeshiva, didn't even have you know the proper a degree or licensing in Series 7. But he decided he wants to work on Wall Street. He went to the New York Stock Exchange and stood outside the gate. And it was, you know, it's gated outside. And he stood there for one day, for two days, for three days. And people were coming. And as they were coming out, he saw a guy with, you know, a double chin and a nice suit. And he said, maybe I could work for you. And the first person looked at him like he's crazy. And the next one said, why? And the third one said, but what do you know? And then finally, one guy said, you know what? You want to get lunch and run the errands? And in those days, they also had like tickets. You would want to purchase stocks. You would take the ticket and run to, to, to give in the order. So he, he said, fine. And he did it. And they paid him, I don't know, maybe four or $500 a week. And he did it. And then, you know, he became close to the people there. And from lunch, he ended up, you know, getting upgraded to make the coffee. And then he did the tickets. And then they, he, he asked people, show me, tell me, teach me. And fast forward, he became a broker dealer. He got a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. He, you know, eventually moved on to bigger and better things and hedge funds and whatnot. But if you want to do something, instead of learning from your own mistakes and making it up as you go, any Ingaman that wants to do Parnassa, sometimes it's too late because I have five kids already and I have to earn $100,000 a year. But remember, if you start a business, you're also at that disadvantage. But I always tell people, choose what it is that you want to do for a living, if you love real estate or mortgages, stock market, and get a job for a year, two years in a company, but not a company. Try to find the best company. Don't focus on what they're paying you. Oh, he offered me 50 and he offered me 70 and he offered me 90. Don't focus on who's paying you what. Focus on who do you think you're going to learn the best from, regardless of whether they pay you, because you're treating it now as going to college. You're learning. You're getting paid to learn. You're getting paid to learn. And regardless of what they pay you, now, fast forward, let's say you decided to do the mortgage business or raise equity. So now that you worked for an amazing, high-end Wall Street firm raising equity with their contacts and their phone book and their mahalach of how to raise money, what do you think you're going to look like in two years having that rigorous professional office teach you and training you for two years and not giving you, like, just letting you do what you want? Do you think you're going to become a professional? And the answer is yes. Now, two years later, so everyone's scenario is a little bit different, but again, I didn't do it this way, and I learned from my own mistakes, but uh, I advise people to do that. Now, fast forward, some people need a job and don't want to be dealing with office and ownership and other issues that it comes along. You know, it always looks nice from the far. So you have to know yourself, but definitely try to get that experience before you start out on your own. So, but I think one of the challenges that people have, you, you brilliantly display the difference of the two approaches, but I think people are confused. They have the temptation of owning a business and thinking that they're going to do it, make it quickly. On the other hand, some people are not suited to be running a company. They don't have the focus, they don't have the, the mindset and the broad vision what it takes. By the way, you guys see I'm holding an orange pen because usually we have the orange mics for Let's Talk Tachlas, but today we wanted, because of Shia's creativity, we decided a little bit to upgrade our marketing um, points. So today we're sitting in an orange chair, holding an orange pen. Let's Talk Tachlas is booming over here. Fact is a fact. Young people have one child, two children, and they... They face a reality. They don't have money to pay the bills, the groceries, the rent. And like you said, of course, if, if they are into five, six children, the, the, the story becomes much harder. But the question is, how do, how do we 
do you have do you offer this particular um, let's say call it mindset clarification to clarify and explain the person what are you suited better for to be running a business and be able to keep it and will help you maintain it and grow it or to give the person the, the good it may look like bad news but the good news we have a much easier ride for you we're going to help you get a job under you understand my, there's a certain point that people said i i met a guy two weeks ago upstate new york and he's sitting at this at this dilemma we sat in a park bench and he tells me i'm going crazy i don't know if i'm created to run a company or i just should give it up give up my dream and just work for someone and do something that i love and stay there continue there what can can you does your service offer also this one of the mentors perhaps this particular clarification process so i think that's a very good question and you're asking a bunch of different questions in one so i think to take it apart i would say as follows first of all as we said before some people are suited for a job others for business even if you're suited for business, it's still worth having the expertise. The fact that you have five kids and you need to make $100,000 doesn't mean that you qualify to make $100,000. For each child, by the way. So when a person says, you know, it's like when 19-year-old boys come over to me and say, I'm looking for a job, I want to be a manager. I'm like, manager? You don't even know how to spell the word manager. What does that mean you want to be a manager of what? So I think that peop that you have to you have to look at a job, like I say, a little bit long term like what's my forecast how do i grow parnasa wise as an individual over the next five years because whatever i do today starting a business or getting a job i'm not going to make a million dollars so i think that if you decide what it is that you like to do because if you're going to do something you don't like to do you're not going to be successful so you can either choose something that you're successful, but when you choose something that you want to do for a living, you have to also remember, because I see a lot of people doing it, and I don't want to name specific industries. But if, here, let me, I don't know how to do this without insulting some industries. No, you can insult an industry as long as not. Let's say you love doing copying keys or being a shoemaker. You have to think to yourself, how many people do you know made $10 million dollars fixing shoes and if the answer is not many then the odds of you being that two percent don't do it if i tell you um construction real estate lawyer doctor um and uh, you know hundreds of industries you could say you know what i know people that did well so choose an industry that there's a good amount of people or a good percentage that were successful not if you achieve to be the top 10%. And also you have to have passion. You must have passion or you're not going to be successful. Right. Um, I, I forgot who said the quote that if you love what you do, then you'll never work a day in your life. So um, so I, I think when, he, when, when someone comes out of Koilul and they want to start working, again, don't say I need to make 100000 because I have five kids. That's why I'm choosing and, and be angry at the world because you don't know what you're doing. So you have to say, you know what? Again, back to our previous conversation. I'm going to college now. I'm going to learn something for six months or a year. It's going to be a little tough. So just like I was in Kailul for seven years, I will be in Kailul for seven years and seven months. I will learn from the best. And then if I'm going to be passionate and I'll be an added value, maybe I can grow in that company. Maybe I can learn and then take that to open my own thing. So that's the mahalach I always encourage people. Now, sometimes people are just a go-getter and they got it and they go it. And, and sometimes if you're the go-getter, I would say, fine, do sales. Because when you go to a company who has an infrastructure and a product ready and you sell for them, the beauty is all you have to do is sell, 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 sell. Decide how much you're making because you're powerful. And let's say they say we're giving you 5%. You just keep on selling. Let them do the girl, the back Backing. office, the, the, the distribution, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the, the manufacturing the importing cash flow, whatever you just sell if you're really that then do it and learn it that way so you feel like you carry your destiny sales is the best business but the hardest business because you have to be willing to be rejected now i also went to yeshiva i had zero education how did i get my first education i wanted to go into the marketing industry but i knew nothing about marketing 
So I heard that there's something called trade shows. We all heard about trade shows. So I always thought you go to a trade show and you see all the different booths and people selling product. What I didn't know, and I came to find out when I registered, is that you can go to classes a day or two or three before or even that day. So whenever they do these big shows at the convention centers, there is always classes that day, the day before, and even the day before that. To know how to navigate in yeah, the convention marketing. center? marketing. No, but it was the purpose of those no, three... No, the, the, mar- the, the, the classes that are given are marketing related. So it's not about the product. About the product, you go to the vendor, he shows you the product. You collect business cards. You collect business cards. But when you go to these different classes, it teaches you more about the industry overall and then very specific. So marketing, they'll teach you about marketing, outreach, advertising, graphics, different ways to enhance your business, to network. So I said, one minute, this is like a free college. So I look online, I see it says, these 20 classes are free. These 20 classes, because the people are well known, who are giving the classes are $99 a class. Now I'm only 23 years old, I'm barely having enough money to fly to Chicago and pay $99 to go to the show. I'm a yeshiva boy. I'm not spending $1,000 on classes for three days. So I chose. I clicked on all the free classes, and I went to the classes. And then when the same thing happened six months later, I went to those free classes. It was in Atlantic City. It was called the Sagney Show. It was made for advertising, marketing, and promotional products. I signed up for $35 and went for two days to all their courses as well. And I learned a lot of things, you know, the 80-20 rule where you don't, you know, whether to rely on, you know, on the big customers, the small customers. Um, They even taught me that, you know, you should try to speak, especially if you're from New York. You don't speak like you're from New York or from, it sounds terrible. And... Sometimes you, you know, you can have a, depending where you come from in America, you could sound one way or the other. They said, try to train yourself to have that mid, you know, mid America accent, like you're from Detroit or, or, you know, somewhere in the middle. And I, I picked it up. If you I can, can tell, tell from I can my, tell, yes. from my accent, um, you almost like it you're helps. from Canada. My wife is from Baltimore. Uh, so I picked Baltimore. it up also. Baltimore. I don't say Baltimore, <laughs> but I, I picked up that Midwestern accent. But I, I gained a lot of information because I had no college. So I used that as my college education. and Without tuition. Without tuition. Right. So I, I think the key is learn, learn, learn. You know, Give it a little time. You don't have to be a manager right away. You don't have to be an owner. You don't have to say it's a good feeling. Again, if you want to do it, do sales. If you want to open your own business, maybe a partner is the right way. Maybe, you know, maybe doing it on your own for a little while. Or going to someone else, learning the trade, and then coming back. Life, Baruch Hashem, is, you know, you have 80 years and 90 years and 100 years. So if you're 23 and 24, or even if you're 32 out of Kailul, give it that extra few months and do it right so you don't learn from your own mistakes. It's almost became like a very high-end financial training conversation. Um, but as I told you, I'd like to bring out a certain point that really in an emotional, in an in a individual way, can enhance people's life. I'm thinking a lot about the current um, situation in America and in the world, the financial situation, and it looks like everyone is, is pointing and starting to think of recession and slow down. And I'm starting to really feel bad for people who barely make it and barely survive. And I don't know if people like to connect to reality, but it looks like it's coming. And I think we should uh, somehow discuss a little bit what chizik or what what undertaking. Some people advise for people to start controlling now their expenses and slow down and all the extras and this and that. I'm thinking if perhaps this can be another um, little little additional. I'm, I'm giving you more work, by the way. I'm about to give you more work. If people can, if you can help people set up the, them, themselves not to get lost, not to panic, and not to go crazy, and not to go into new credit card expenses, which are very, a max for many people anyway, but uh, is it something that crossed your mind to address a little bit this, the next two, three years that look a little bit doomed? Although I'm a positive person, and I'm everybody will do fine, 
But reality is also sometimes a good ingredient in life. So I both stand on the side of the nonprofit where I try to be helpful as much as I can to people. And I'm also in the uh, real estate and construction space. So I'm very well aware of what you're saying. In terms of uh, having a crystal ball to say what it's coming, of course, we see rising interest rates and we see some other factors. But people said it from 2012 to 2016, 18, 20, and even right now. So it's hard to see how it's going to exactly play out. But I do agree with you that the forecast seems to be somewhat grim, whether it be the, you know, the oil, uh, gas prices, interest rate hikes. So food cost. Food cost, right. So there are definitely a lot of factors, you know, inflation. So there are definitely a lot of factors which are not in our favor. And the question is, will it happen? How bad? But like you say, you definitely have to um, be ahead of the curve. So Just in short, like a real small inspiration. So obviously it's always guide. smart from a business perspective and from a personal financial perspective, you know, to forego what you don't need and try to save up money for two reasons. Because number one, if something bad happens, you have money. Also, if something bad happens and you have cash, then you're the king. So you can, you'll have a double. My purchase. Right. But at the end of the day, for the average person who has a job, you know, hopefully they have their job and they keep their job and life goes on because everything is a cycle. So if you're old enough to remember and you are 2008, which I was part of, it hurt, but it took time and hopefully some people recovered, some, you know, maybe didn't, but, but the cycles happen. So in short, so an individual, A, of course, try to cut back, you know, it's very easy to tell someone else, but when you have, uh, you know, you have Haimish, Balabatish, Sepasnish, living with the neighbors, yeshiva, tuition, food, you know, if someone is spending $2 million a year, you're like, calm down. But if a person is making $150,000 a year and between his food and two cars and tuition, he's at 149, you can't tell them to cut back. But then again, recession or recession, it's all the same. So I guess in short, yes, try to save because right? So you have to try to save and uh, you have to try to be, uh, as they say in Yiddish, vorsichtig. And try to be. I love your Galician Yiddish. It's so juicy. It's so tender. I love it. See that? My mother was very. Uh, my mother made sure that I. Uh, adamant. She was very adamant that I spoke uh, good Galician Yiddish. Nice. It, it reminded me, 2008, a relative of mine came over to me and told me, I, w I want to give you a piece of advice, which you bless me and bench me by the end of the recession. I said, okay. Wherever you see a group of people, no, doesn't matter who, crying, complaining, and forecasting bad and gray and black, just walk away. You'll deal with your life. Hashem will help you, will help everyone. But if most conversations, most kremlech, most um, gatherings, we're talking, oh, this is coming, this is happening, this talk, this is. If you see such a group, walk away. Do whatever you want to do. Hopefully you'll do well. And I think it's a very, it's very good advice because people get sucked in. Besides the actual problems and limitations, people get sucked into doom and gloom and they become vertracht and verchmarret. Stay out of it. That's very true. My wife once said something very true years ago. She said, the first day that you stop feeling bad for yourself will be the first day of the rest of your life. So if you get, you know, sucked in, like you say, to different groups, different people, different thought processes, where you feel bad for yourself, it's so important to stay positive and to not feel bad for yourself. It's so easy today. People have labels and they try to, you know, justify why their life is not going well. It's my boss. It's my teacher. I don't make enough money. My wife, my kids, my school, my shul. But the, the, the minute you stop blaming other people and you take responsibility and it's not that it is your fault maybe it's not your fault you know my father passed away when i was six years old i can blame the world or i can stop feeling bad for yourself move on so i think that that's a very important musa haskell and it doesn't pertain to me necessarily alone i'm saying everyone because we all can find a reason you know like when i was a kid either you were hyperactive or you're normal today add hd hd uh, i think the, the alphabetical Right, this is too short. It's too short. 
They need more codes, more letters today to describe so many conditions. Right. So I think it's very important. You know, we all are great people. We all have positive energy, and we can choose to exercise that, or we can choose to feel bad for ourselves. And I think that as soon as we have that mindset, you know, I always tell people it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's always like that. So the difference between a very successful person and a person that's just talking too much is how they say it, right? You can both be selling stocks. Why is this person doing $10 billion in business and this person doing $10 in business and they're both doing the same thing and wearing the same suit? It's all about mindset and it's all about how you say it. It's not what you say because you're both saying, please buy a deal for me, please buy shoes for me, please use my company, but you're saying it different, your presentation, your mindset, and when you have positive energy and you submit it, it comes back. People, people, Penetrates. people love to be with winners. They love to be with positive people. When Ayn is ungesetzt, when people are upset and always in a bad mood, you know, misery loves company, but no one wants to be with that company. And that's exactly why I came here today, because I like to be ne next to positive people, to leaders, to doers. To people who not just don't don't just dream, they take their dreams into reality. And I want to thank you so much for being at Let's Talk Tachlis podcast. I think we the, our audience will learn a lot from you, and I really want to admire you for you could have spent much more of your time making more money and doing more things for your own personal life, and you chose to slice a big piece of your day and of your week and month and years in life. For Klal Yisrael, I admire that. And Yir B'Kemo Yisrael B'Yisrael, thank you so much. I mean, thank you once again for the opportunity. And again, in life, you only have what you give. So it's an honor, and I, I inspire to hopefully, you know, accomplish for Klal Yisrael. And it gives me the biggest sip of kanefesh. You know, we all try to make money, and that's a tool that we use. But uh, I hope this inspires the average person like myself who's working to, you know, I always tell my children, and uh, you can be one of six billion people, or you could be someone who's making a difference. So I don't know if I am making a difference, but at least we have I to do. try. I do. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.